Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. Just making a, a quick video for a gentleman who's emailed me from my website. I won't name his name because he probably uh, want to remain anonymous. But anyhow, he's responding to my video concerning um, me challenging Christian apologies to... Um, some will say that um, it's not the words of God that, that's important, it's the message. And that... Uh, Christianity is about the charisma, the death and resurrection of Christ, and it's not uh, a w about the word-for-word -word exact Bible, etc. And uh, I also went on to challenge James White and J. Smith on textual criticism. But this gentleman um, has um, emailed me, and he's emailed me concerning this. So he says this, uh, forgive me, I'm, my, my hand's a bit tired. It says, um, the words in the Bible are not the words of God. God is not limited by man's vocabulary. Man is. Man is incarcerated by his vocabulary. Therefore, the message of a messenger is limited only by the vocabulary of the messenger. And the understanding of that message is limiting only by the understanding of the one to whom the message is spoken. What can limit the understanding of the person to whom a message is given? Our understanding is limited by our vocabulary. Our vocabulary is equal to understanding of language. Language is not the word of God. It is the word of man's limited understanding, which it has over many centuries developed. How we now define the world has evolved through our understanding of it. What is now a hypothesis to be tested was once dogma claiming to be fact. It was our faith in dogma that place limits with our own mind. Your interpretation of the Bible is just that. It's not the word of God, it is a testimony based upon faith and delivered with integrity. It is the meaning that is of value, not the words. Okay, so uh, I relish this opportunity. I appreciate this guy uh, sending me uh, a uh, email I really appreciate it and what I like about this guy is he's intellectually honest he's, he's given a, a fair presentation of his position and he's being open and honest about his position and he's arguing with integrity so thank you for uh, giving me the time uh, and, and sharing your thoughts I really appreciate I really appreciate that and uh, I'm not anti-intellectual and I believe in free speech. So anybody who wants to engage with me intellectually uh, and debate with me and discuss with me can always go to my website and email me. And if you're a person who is genuinely honest, wants dialogue and discussion, then I will engage with you. I'll either make you a video or I'll, I'll send you an email. I'm going to send this gentleman an email in a minute. Um, I'm not interested in people who just want to argue for argue's sake who, or who have an agenda just to try and put a, another person down because I get emails where people want to argue with me but it's just about about putting you down rather than actually engaging, you know. But this guy, I think, really wants to engage. So let's just deconstruct it. The words in the Bible are not the word of God so he's made a categorical statement there and the reason the words in the Bible are not the word of God is what God is not limited by man's vocabulary and then he goes man is then he goes man is incarcerated by his vocabulary okay Uh, my first response to that is, well, before you critique a position, before you critique the Christian position, uh, you have to give a fair presentation of the position, and you have to deal with it exegetically. So obviously you're not dealing with it exegetically here. There's no exegesis going on in your statement. So what's happening here is you're coming at it from a philosophical point of view. So... I'll deal with it exegetically. 
If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So what it's saying there is uh, God breathed out the word. He's using men to write the word, but he's breathing it out. Okay. So that completely from an exegetical point of view completely demolishes what you're saying the words in the bible are not the word of god this verse says differently it says the words are breathed out by god okay now you say god is not limited by man's vocabulary i would totally agree god is not limited by his vocabulary all the knowledge of God is is not completely within the Word of God. The Word of God tells us uh, about God and um, gives us knowledge about God, but it doesn't exhaust God. So we would agree with that. But it is a revelation from God about God. And the problem that you're missing here is that God created language and the reason he created language is because he is a relational God. Okay? So, when you're saying God is not limited by man's vocabulary, that is true to, to a certain extent. But at the same time, you're failing to understand that Christianity is rooted in Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That within the Trinity, there is communication and relationship. And that language has been created in order that we might have that relationship with God. And so, therefore, it is only logical that if God is, is relational, if God has created language in order to be relational with Him, it's only logical then that he would use language that we may, uh, that he would use our language in order to communicate to us. And you could flip it over when you say God is not limited by man's vocabulary. Well, God is not limited by God, by man's uh, humanity. But yet God became flesh and dwelled among us so so what we see here so what we see here in John chapter 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so here it is confirming what I was saying that God is a relational God and language is part of that relationship in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, the Word became flesh. You know, the Word became flesh. God came into human nature. Now, does that mean God has limited himself? What it means is the very nature of God, it is, ex it is actually expressing the very nature of God. The nature of God is his humility and his love and his relational aspect so um, language does not limit God God uses language to express the relational aspect of his nature to humanity okay and in that he uses it to express and to inform and to 
protect the interpretation of what he is communicating and uh, so th those are just some philosophical uh, rebuttals to what you're saying there therefore the message of the messenger is limited only by the vocabulary of the messenger and the understanding of that message is limiting only by the understanding of the one to whom the message is spoken therefore the message of a messenger is limited only by the vocabulary of the messenger that assumes that God is limited by time because he says therefore a message of a messenger is limited only by the vocabulary of the messenger so he's saying that if God uses language that is human then he's limited by the vocabulary of that language but it assumes um, that God is limited by time it, it doesn't realize that God is above time and God knows the you, you know he, he knew before time began the language that was going to be used in order to communicate to human beings so it's actually the right language that he wanted to use okay so there's no limitation there if God has chosen that language in order to be able to use it to communicate to, to people in other words it was a language that was just what he needed and wanted to communicate to human beings so then it goes what can limit the understanding of the person to whom a message is given our understanding is limited by a vocabulary again the vocabulary was also was chosen before the beginning of time our vocabulary is equal to the understanding of language language is not the word of God again you you just keep making these statements our vocabulary is equal to understanding of language our vocabulary is equal to understanding of language again I know what you're trying to say and uh, again I would I would come back at that and say our vocabulary is equal to the understanding of language but it presumes that God is limited by that language it doesn't uh, give room that God is free to use a language like I said God is out of time and he is free to use a language and just because that language is a, a limited set of vocabulary doesn't mean to say that it's limited God because God God in his creativity can use a limited language and make that a a device that communicates exactly what he wants I'll give you an example Take a, a broken, uh, uh, an old violin that's not well tuned and it's it's not very good, right? Take a person who is not a very good, can't play the violin. They get hold of the violin and they mess with the violin, play with the violin and it's just not, it's just not, um, it's just not playing very well, yeah? But now get a master violinist. A master violinist. And there's no limitation anymore. The violin now is expressing. It, it, he's tuned it. And he's playing it perfectly. And it's now expressing the noise. So that, that it, in a beautiful way. And in a way that's the way God in his infinity and in his infinite power can take a, a menial language that is limited in terms of its language and vocabulary because he is infinite, infinitely wise, loving and powerful 
is able to bring into that language in a way a beautiful noise like a brilliant violinist in a way that human beings would be limited in using that language but with God he's not limited he's able to bring the best out of that language does that make sense so you know these are my rebuttals to your philosophical conundrums here uh, language is not the word of God again you state that but you gotta come back to exegesis it is the word of man's limited understanding which has however many centuries developed again you're assuming uh, that God can't use language you're, you're assuming uh, you, you need to define your definition of God, the Christian God is a Trinitarian God, who is relational, so you need, you've not defined properly your understanding of God. How we now define the world has evolved through our understanding of it, yes, I would agree. What is now a hypothesis to be tested was once dogma claiming to be fact. Mm. Again, what you're doing is you're, you're correcting human knowledge and new, human understanding is a developing factor. It's a, develop, it's a development throughout time and history, and I would agree with that. But you're, again, you're assuming that God, that God cannot... You're assuming that God cannot work. It, it, you, you're assuming certain things about God. You're assuming that he's out of time and cannot come in time. You're assuming that in time, God cannot come in time and express himself these are assumptions that you're assuming in your statements how we now define the world has evolved through the understanding of it yes but that doesn't necessarily mean that God cannot come in to time and communicate to us through human words what is now a hypothesis to be tested once was dogma claiming to be fact it was our faith in dogma that place limits with our own mind. Now here, you're kind of giving yourself away now. This is giving yourself away, bro. When you said that, it, it was our faith in dogma that placed limits within our own mind. Well, uh, let me give you this book and go and read it. You need to go and read this, bro. God's Philosophers, published by James Hannum. That refutes it. That refutes what you're saying. How the medieval world laid the foundation for modern science. All right. So that book shows you that actually Christianity was um, very strongly used to develop the scientific method. Okay. So, you know, there's historical data that you can go and study that refutes what you're saying. It was our faith in dogma that placed limits within our own mind. Your interpretation of the Bible is just that. It's not the word of God. It is a testimony based upon faith and delivered with integrity. There you're, there you're contradicting yourself. It's not the word of God. It is a testimony based upon faith. If it's a testimony based on faith, let, 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 let me just give you some thoughts. If there, if there is no word of God, then we couldn't know whether testimony was correct or not. Because testimony, historical testimony, um, can be corrupted. Historical testimony can um, have competing evidences against what that testimony is saying. 
Um, our presuppositions that we have within our nature, um, within within our worldviews, colour our interpretation of the testimony. So, for example, a Muslim looks at it from Muslim eyes, a Hindu looks at it from Hindu eyes, etc. History. So, the Word of God encapsulates the testimony so that we can understand the testimony and know that the testimony has been preserved properly okay it's kinda like um, you know the Jurassic Park when they found a, a little bit of uh, a fly in some in, in, in some white uh, substance you know um, like a, a um, a shell, a shell of kind of, um, you know, it's kind of, it kind of looks like plastic. But the your name is in the plastic. It's not plastic, but it's kind of kind of in glass or something, you know. But the 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 fly has been preserved for for however many 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 years, yeah, in Jurassic Park film. And it's that's the kind of where the word of God is with historical data and evidence and facts is God's preserved it them within the shell of his word to know that we have concrete solidity in what we are reading is true so historical data uh, and testimony uh, verify the truth but it's protected by the Word of God. The Word of God protects it, makes sure that the testimony uh, has been properly preserved and is properly interpreted correctly because all facts require an interpretation. And so the Word of God gives you that interpretation of those facts. You interpret saying, and it is not the word of God, it is the testimony based upon faith and delivered with integrity. Why you brought the word integrity, I don't know. You, you seem to be sceptical, yet you seem to have some kind of Christian leaning. Now you say, it is the meaning that is of value, not the word. So, you kind of... Um, you kind of uh, seem to be a skeptic, but yet you seem to be Christian. This seems a, a, a Christian kind of argument from from Christians, well-meaning Christians, but Christians who are not grounded in in theology. So he says, "It is the meaning that is of value, not the words." Okay, let's. Um, if it's the meaning that is of value, how do you answer this? We'll just bring this up as a point. Revelation twenty two nineteen And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy God shall take away his part out of the book of life. So, if it's just meaning, why would John there say, if you take away the words from this prophecy, you'll be cursed? Let's go to Psalm 119. So, So we'll just read a bit from verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in the ways thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. All that 
My ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of the heart. When I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, I will keep thy statutes or forsake me not utterly. Wherein shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed unto thereunto according to you ready? Thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee, or let me not wander from the commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You see, it's not just the ideas. It's the words have power. The words carry the ideas. The words have power. Okay? The word of God has power. And um, it's not just the ideas. The Bible teaches not just the ideas, but the words are important too. Okay. Now, um, there's been some good discussions by atheists. Uh, I've written uh, a paper on an atheist. Uh, if you go onto my website, there's a paper that I wrote on a, an atheist philosopher. Uh, whose name has, has lost me at the moment. He's well known on the internet at the moment. And he was on a show and, and he did a brilliant, uh, this atheist did a brilliant discussion uh, with another atheist on Oliphant's, uh, the theologian at Westminster Theological Seminary. They did a great discussion on Van Tilian apologetics. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. And they were talking about language, the analogy of language, and, Calv uh, and, and Van Til's understanding of language and how it relates to God. And, and just to say that, you know, language um, gives us knowledge of God. It's not exhaustive knowledge because we're, we're only finite, we're only limited, but it does give us knowledge, okay? And again, I've tried to explain from a Trinitarian point of view why language is valuable and why, why God uses human language in order to communicate to us. So I think, just to recap, uh, the person who sent me this, your argument is philosophical, it's not rooted in exegesis. That's number one. Number two, you don't define who God is. And you miss the... Uh, no, miss the fact that Christianity is rooted in Trinity, which is a relational God. Number three, you don't realize that God is above time, and so therefore has planned the language that we, he used in the Bible. That he not only is above time, that he can work in time, you assume that he can't. And because he can work in time, he can take not only language, he can take a human body, and express himself through that because it's part of his nature to be relational and you know those are some of the main points that that this philosophical and theological dis discussion about language uh, and the nature of God uh, has come to so uh, books to recommend to read uh, well, I would go and have a look at my paper that I wrote on this atheist. Uh, you'll have to find where it is, but there's a there is a section with Jason's uh, with some pieces that I've written. Um, you can go and find that. Um, I think. Uh, Excuse me. I think you can go and read this uh, on the Word of God. Um, e e uh, L Robert L. Raymond goes into uh, philosophical parts about language and the nature of the Word of God. Uh, so that's very, very good book. It's by Nelson. A new systematic theology. 
Um, and you could, uh, I think, read just read a few of uh, Francis Schaeffer's books because um, uh, everywhere, every now and again, he'll touch on philosophical topics which are related to theology. So, um, yeah. So the other one is. Um, I've not read this book, I've, I've been given it, but um, I have read snippets of John Frame on his, on his website, but the doctrine of the knowledge of God by Presbyterian and Reformed um, is a book on which, which, which covers language and the theolo uh, the philosophical aspect of language and its relationship to knowledge of God and I, I have read some of his articles on his website which is very very helpful so um, so I hope I hope this has been a help to you bro um, I've just given you a bit of time and just to show you that I, I, I'll try and answer some of your questions all right so God bless you and take care God bless <laughs>